Thank you for joining us at First Assembly of God Church in Clear Lake, California. Please welcome Reverend Lisa Kugler. I just want to open in prayer really quick. Lord, I just thank you for soil tonight that's prepared, good ground. You said it's going to yield 30, 60, and 100 fold. And I thank you, Lord, that you don't prepare seed that's going to fall on bad soil. So I just know that the word you gave me today is for tonight and for these people and, I, and for myself. And I pray that you'd open our hearts, open our minds, transform us from the inside out and to bring you glory in Jesus name. Amen. So I'm just going to get right into it. Uh, the title of this message is see the world from a different perspective. Yeah, and I had some help for uh, putting this together this morning from pastor because he's really good at interpreting what God says to me when I can't. I love it. When you're sinking, sometimes God will send you someone to help you, right? So I had three different messages prepared for today, and they're all in the garbage can. And I'm thinking, I should have saved those, <laughs> but I'll get it again, you know. Um, but my point is, is that I don't want God's will. I don't want to say what I want to say because I have a lot to say. I, I want to hear from God and say what he wants you to hear for you where you're at so that you could grow. And um, I had five minutes to actually go through this after I put it together, so if I don't explain something in, in deep depth, let the Holy Spirit reveal it to you because his word could say a whole lot more than I can. And these scriptures are meant for study outside of here, not just when you come and you hear it. If you take notes when you go home, you're going to get more out of it. Amen? So our perspective is the lens at which we view life and most importantly, what you know is true. As Christians, this wisdom should come from what? God's word. Romans 12, 2. I have verse 1 up there, but I'm going to return to it to read verse 1 later. But I'm going to start at verse 2. It tells us, And do not be conformed to this world any longer with its superficial values and customs, but be transformed and progressively changed as you mature spiritually by the renewing of your mind focusing on godly values and ethical attitudes so that you may prove for yourself what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect in his plan and purpose for you. So we're surrounded by superficial customs and values that people are operating in all the time. And some of those things are still within us. We have still a worldly side. It's being like um, what you hear sometimes referred to as a carnal Christian. And a lot of us still struggle with being carnal. That means we're in a process of going through sanctification. And we don't arrive overnight. And God doesn't save us and save our minds too. He gives us the ability to work with the Holy Spirit. And he transforms our mind as we put the word of God in. And so um, next time that I come, I'm going to talk about what the Word of God does and how it transforms you deeper. But for us tonight, um, the world has these customs and these values, and they see life through the perspective of that, right? But we're to look into God's Word. We're Christians are to be transformed, turned from godly I mean, godless, worldly ways, and be changed by the way we see things, focusing on godly values and ethical attitudes so we can prove what the will of God is for us. And we always say, what's the will of God? What's the will of God? But it's very clear in his word what it is. And when you seek him, there's nothing he wouldn't show you. Um, I had a friend post something on Good Friday that really blew my mind. And I kind of was stuck on this Facebook post for a couple of days, and I didn't really understand why it affected me so bad other than I was worried about his salvation. But I want to read it to you and the responses that went along with it. And remember, Good Friday, everybody was posting about Jesus dying on the cross, and then Sunday resurrection was coming. So all Facebook was flying with any of my Christian friends on my Facebook page and my post too. And this person doesn't have a relationship with God, but his wife's a Christian. So somehow she married him and stayed with him. And I don't know how they live together at peace, but they love each other and they do. 
and no condemnation. I'm just saying like it's better to be yoked together with someone that you can grow in the Lord with, that believe together, you can pray together, you don't have to hide who you are, that you can operate freely and be in the spirit with your mate. But, you know, there's also a time when some people get saved and then others come along and are slow. (laughs) And they're worth waiting for to God. But this post said, The God of my understanding has truly changed over the past 10 years. And believe me, it's not about the guy in the Bible. It's a nice bedtime story. But for me, that's all it's about. People back then had no idea how to explain what they saw. I'm not worried about going to hell. And I doubt very seriously there's a heaven. At least not the one that the Bible talks about. Taking things on faith is one thing, but blind faith without further investigation doesn't make sense. So upon further investigation, this is my opinion. Thank you and have a good day. A few responses. (laughs) I started praying right there before I even read the responses. I'm like, Jesus, what did you do to make him mad? (laughs) I was kidding. Um. The world's, this one person responded, the world's fastest growing religion is none. I strive to remain open-minded. Since I was born with a brain and am not at all, not a know-it-all, I think it's important to continue to remain open as new revelations are constantly being renewed, i.e. agnostic. But the only revelation you're going to get is what's already been done. Nothing's new under the sun. And unless God reveals it to you, then it's a new revelation, right? But there's some people who are once had a revelation of God and then have gone backwards uh, uh, in rebellion against God. And I'll get to that some more later. Um, this other lady responded, I feel sorry for you. And the main poster responded, don't feel sorry for me. I've been renewed. A new look on things with an open mind. And once your mind is open to new things, you can start questioning society's old stuff and all the facts that were supposed to be facts that were basically pushed on you as children, like once believing in God. And I thought about that and I thought, wow, how the enemy has filled people's minds and lied and lied and lied and the lies put you in darkness and the darkness covers the light. And you have a choice to receive truth or to reject truth. And I want to take you guys through the word of God because this morning when the Lord woke me up, I heard that phrase, see the world through a different perspective. And I'm like, what does that mean? Because I only see one way. <laughs> I see Jesus. I mean, I have some worldly stuff, but like I know where I'm going, right? Most of the time, unless I get stuck in the dark and then I try to find out with the Lord where I'm going. But he took me to some scriptures today and I couldn't believe what he showed me. And now I want to read it to you. So 2 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 4, and I'm using mostly the Amplified and I'm going to change to the Good News translation at the end. But This scripture tells us that even if our gospel is, in some sense, hidden behind a veil, it is hidden only to those who are perishing. Among them, the God, little God, of this world has blinded the mind of the unbelieving to prevent them from seeing the illuminating light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. This was written by Paul. You know, he preached the gospel. He was bold. He was humble. He renounced the hidden things of his past life, the shameful things of his past life. You know, he didn't walk in craftiness. He didn't walk in deceit. He didn't water down the gospel. He preached an unadulterated gospel, the truth, pure truth. And he did it because of the revelation of Christ. And in our society today, we have a church with Christians in it because some of them are preaching a deluded message of the cross. People's witnesses have changed. They no longer serve the God of the Bible. They serve the God of their understanding. And it's not that they haven't heard the truth. You have Christians turning away from the things of God because they want their sin. So all those things 
present the church to people outside looking in. They're like, well, I can go do these things without God. I can be my own God. I don't need the God of the Bible because it's changed in the last 10 years. I've got to be open-minded. I've got to be waiting for new revelation. So these things that were once pushed down my throat, I can be opened up to new things. And God have mercy on my friend. And I'm going to send him this message tonight because it's in love. It's not in condemnation. I'm not uncovering this person to hurt this person, single this person out. But hell is real. And so is Jesus who wants to keep you from going there. And um, we have a responsibility to tell the truth. And we have a responsibility to tell it the way God tells it, not the way we think it should be to comfort people, to have compassion. We can love the sinner and love on them deeply and intercede for them, but we are not to love the sin and, and, um, and make it okay. Like yesterday, I had this patient come in, and I didn't have a chance to look at the chart, but it wasn't in the chart anyway, so it was a good thing because I didn't get in trouble. But then I thought, why do I care if I get in trouble? Because we're supposed to name people the way that their chart reads, and if we say it wrong, you know, we can get in trouble. And so when I called the person's last name, they came, but they weren't a man. They were a woman. And I got walking down the hallway with this person, and I introduced him to the doctor, and I said, he is here for whatever. And he looked at me, and he goes, my pronouns are whatever he said, and then he said, candy. And I said, candy? Candy? And I started laughing, and he started laughing because he wasn't mad at me, right? He just was very, or sh- whatever. It was just very sweet. The conversation was very sweet. The Lord worked it out. And um, he explained to me, you know, they say she or her, but he's like, well, I'm like Hershey. I'm like chocolate. Her and she. Anyway, he made a joke out of it. And, and um, when I left there, I called him a guy again, and he just giggled down the hall. And the bottom line is, is that there's some of us that can't adjust. And he didn't condemn me, and I don't think anybody else is going to, but my job really wants us, they give us training on how to talk to people. And I have a Wednesday clinic, it's a transgender clinic that we help veterans with the process of transgender completion. And you know, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mission field, because God loves them. And they just had some wrong thinking along the way. And I've had wrong thinking before I came to the Lord. And if God didn't have mercy on me, I wouldn't be standing here right now. And um, anyway, so we had a good laugh about it. And I went out about my day. And I share that with you because we are all going to face those moments where we're going to come across people. You know, I have people in my life that are struggling with certain things like this. And, it, and it's going to call for me to stand on the truth when those questions are being asked. So what do you think about this? Well, this is my opinion. This is where I stand. But it's not an opinion I based on a perspective that I got from the world. It's an opinion that I based on the perspective that I've got from God's word. So when I share it with you, it'll go in and it'll be a seed planted that the Lord is going to water. And it's not going to be a seed planted that's going to tear someone down. It's going to build them up. It's going to change them. It's going to transform them. If they should choose to receive the truth. They have a free will to receive or reject the truth. Saying all that to say, Paul was once Saul. And you guys know the story about him, how he was on the road to Damascus. And he had been the Pharisee of all Pharisees. He was Jewish. He sat under the law. He knew the law better than anybody. And he had clout. He had everything you could ever want. And he stood out. And he shined. But I'll tell you what happened. When he persecuted Christians for following the way, who is the way? Jesus, who's a Christian, anybody who follows Jesus. And he persecuted him. He would drag him into court, put him in prison. He'd kill him. You know, he was in favor of all of that. And you know what? I have to tell you this. He had that moment on that road, and this bright light came out of nowhere, and it hit him, and he fell down to the ground, and he heard the voice, and it's, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Jesus considered him persecuting the Christians, as it was, he took it personal, persecuted it as himself. And, um, you know, there was a part of the scripture later on that said, why do you kick against the goads? Well, a goad was a stick with a point on it. And every time they would want to push an animal or an urgent animal, they would use this goad and the animal would kick back and hit that point and it would cause pain. 
Well, if the Lord said that to him at some point, don't you think the Lord had been speaking to him while he's persecuting Christians? And maybe he was just rejecting and rejecting and rejecting. And eventually, what happened? He had that encounter with Jesus. And he said, who are you? And he's like, you know, he, Jesus reveals himself. And then he says, what do you want me to do, Lord So he went from not receiving and being the Pharisee of the Pharisees, looking for the Messiah, because they all were, to coming right in face to face with the Messiah. And he was so zealous in the world, so zealous for the law, so zealous in the things of the flesh. What was going to happen when he gets saved and transformed? He's going to be zealous for Jesus to the point that he's so on fire that his purpose would carry him all the way through, right? Nothing was going to phase him because his purpose was set and he was on fire on the inside. There was no lukewarmness in him at all. I like it when I skip my notes because it's better than what I got written. <laughs> um, so Romans 12.3 says that God gives every man a measure of faith. Romans 1, 19 through 20 says, Because that which is known about God is evident within them in their inner conscience, for God made it evident to them, verse 20 says, Forever since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. Being understood through his workmanship, all his creation the wonderful things that he has made so that they who fail to believe and trust in him are without excuse and without defense. When people have had a revelation of who the Lord is, their conscience bears witness. You can't say you weren't told. You can't say you didn't know. You can't explain it away because he's revealed himself and you had a choice. You can choose him or you can reject him. And it says right here, proof in the word of God. I didn't say it. It says, this is for who fail to believe and trust in him. Okay? So the conscience bears witness. There are those who do not want to know the truth. There are those who suppress the truth for themselves and for other people. I remember teaching uh, missionettes in this girl in seventh grade told me, I don't want to know any more about the Bible because then I have to obey it. I want to go do what I want to do and I don't want to be accountable for it. At least she was smart. Seventh grade. And she could tell you that if she knew the word of God, she's going to have to abide it. Right? That tells you something. There's conviction there. Our conscience knows. People who say they don't believe, their conscience knows. Yeah. Yeah, um, you can't claim that you don't know because he reveals himself, right? So I have to tell you this. I had this thought one time, like, I bet hell for some people, they're going to have that record playing in their head when they denied Christ. I could, it's probably over and over and over. The enemy's just going to sit there and torment them for the rest of the life of eternity. And it's like, I don't want to be that person. I don't want to reject the Lord ever. I might sometimes, and I, you know, in willingness to sin sometimes, but I need a lot of work. And I'm sure you guys need a lot of work too. But getting back to perspective, perspective is a lens in which we view life. And more importantly, what you know is true. John 14, 6 tells us that Jesus said, I am the way the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. How do you think Saul became Paul? Because he had a revelation of the way. He was mad at the Christians because they knew the way, but he didn't want them to follow that way because the law said this, and it was in direct conflict with the Jewish religion, what Christianity believed. But Jesus has always been there. In the Old Testament, the law pointed to Jesus. They missed it. But Paul had the opportunity to have a transformed life and to preach to the very people that were in the same situation that he is. And this goes for people today that are Jewish today. They have the ability to see Jesus. I remember my doctor that I worked with, he was my child pediatrician. 
And I worked with him, and his mom was Jewish. She was 90, and he had to go over to Israel. And he's like, I can't tell my mom I'm a Christian. She'll die. She'll die right here, and then she'll be haunting me from the grave. And he was kidding, but I think he had to go and tell his mom that he was Christian because he could not go tell her. And so, you know, I've never seen him again after that. He moved, and, and I lost contact with him. But I, when I get to heaven, I, I'll find out because we used to have a lot of talks about the Lord. <laughs> yeah. Romans 1, 6, uh, Romans chapter 1, 16, and this is in the Good News translation. Paul said, I have complete confidence in the gospel. It is pa God's power to save all who believe. There's a choice. All who believe. You have a choice to believe it or reject it. First the Jews and then also the Gentiles. The Gentiles are us, people who are not Jews. That's the bottom line. But faith is, we've talked about this a million times, it's belief and trust. And God gives every man ability to have a measure of faith. We all have this equal amount of faith. Hebrews 12.2 says, Looking away from all that will distract us and focusing our eyes on Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of faith, giving the first incentive for our belief and the one who brings our faith to maturity, who for the joy of accomplishing the goal set before him in endured the cross, disregarding the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne, revealing his deity, his authority, and the completion of his work. Paul was not ashamed to preach the gospel, and we should not be either. In Romans 12, 2, Paul used two words, conform and transform. In the Greek, conform gives off the idea of an outward change with what's popular. Like, you know, your body changes. Like six months ago, I looked 10 pounds lighter, right? Our clothes have changed. Our styles have changed. How we use body language has changed, right? Those are outward changes. This is what that scripture is talking about. It's like, it's about an outward change. Transformed is talking about an inner change. It's the, the matter of the heart. It's something that once you're dead set on it, it can't be changed. The true transformation, right? You go from one thing to another. And he was saying, in order to really worship and serve God, we must undergo a change, but not an outward form. It has to be inward. It has to be involving our personality. It has to involve our mind, our will, our emotions, our feelings. They have to come under subjection to the Lord and to his will. And when you offer yourself every day, as a living sacrifice, which Romans 12.1 talks about, our act of service to the Lord is offering ourselves every morning, our mind, our will, our emotions, our hands, our feet, our eyes, our ears, everything that we are, we offer it. Okay, Lord, not my will, but your will. You make a conscious decision to lay down your life. And isn't that what baptism was all about anyway? You died to the old life. And now you've been risen to a new life in Christ. It's no longer you who live, but it's Christ who lives in you. The more you die, the more he lives in you. And there's still a lot of us that we, we know it, but we don't live it. We hear it, but we're not acting it out. And we have to meditate on those things. And we have to work with the Holy Spirit on those worldly areas so that we can be transformed in those places. That means once we're transformed, we're not going back. We have a choice to go back, but it's easier when God has really given you revelation and you really have a foundation there to hold on to. You're like, no, I'm set in stone. How did Paul get on fire like that? He knew how to be zealous. We all know how to hold on in the flesh. We know how to hold on to the things that make us feel good. But we need to let go and let God, right? It's that easy, but it's that hard. And I just have to laugh because I was telling the Lord yesterday, I'm like, there's so many things wrong with me. Why are you calling me to do this? Why do you want me to go tell people things? Because then I got to live it and then I fall down and then people see me and my husband tells me, you can't yell at the lady at the shoe store because you might be on TV one day. And I'm like, I don't care. I, I want to get mad about my shoes. <laughs> but we don't get the opportunity to be mad about our shoes anymore because you know what? <laughs> that lady needs Jesus, and I have him. And I'm supposed to be a witness. 
I was supposed to be on fire, not lukewarm. And I'm going to talk to you about that in a minute. Yes. <laughs> that sh- yes. That's good. But so when God reveals something to us, us people today, in his word, he gives you the power to overcome that thing because you're a believer. You're not just believing to get saved anymore. You've already been saved. You're believing to live it out now. You have transformation happening in you all the time. Every time a word goes in and you receive it, that area is being transformed. You're no longer the other man. You're the new man, the new creation, created new for good works. He died so that we could die. And he was risen so we could rise with him. He wants to share that journey with us here. He wants us to experience the resurrection power. And I believe it for everybody else. But there's some areas where I have a bad mouth. My mouth, oh boy. Like it wants to get defensive and it wants to say stuff and it wants to be mean and blah. And, you know, the Lord's like, I gave you that mouth to preach the gospel. I gave you that mouth to encourage people. I gave you that mouth to speak life. So what does the enemy want me to do and what does my flesh want to do? Oh God, these things that I have in me, like Paul says, I don't know why I do them, but I do them. But thank God for Jesus who will deliver me from this body of death, right? So I can believe for resurrection power with my mouth and it's going to be a while because some things are so embedded in us that we have to work really hard. And you know, we can't change ourselves. That's what grace is for. Grace isn't, I heard this the other day, grace is not permission to live a sloppy life and just sin whatever way we want and think God's just going to be okay with it. Keep on living that way. Keep on doing it. No, grace is the not only favor, but it's the power to stop. It's the power to do something different. It's the power to overcome. The Bible says in Romans 8, 37, that we're more than a conqueror. Well, Jesus conquered death and sin, and he gave us the ability to be more than a conqueror because we didn't have to do it. We just received the benefit. We believe it, and then we get to live it. We didn't have to go through the pain and suffering in the body. We just go through pain and suffering in the flesh. (laughs) So, I don't even know where I'm at. But, um, I just want to say this. Israel, Hosea is one of the best stories in the Old Testament, and that whole thing is all about how Israel were a people who backslid from the Lord. And they found idols, they created idols, they got involved in pagan worship, they had sex acts and orgies and the most disgusting things you could ever possibly imagine they were doing. They were sacrificing children, much of like what we have going on today. They didn't even know that they were human anymore because they had lost sight of the Creator and what they were created for, their purpose. But God, in his mercy, used Hosea to reveal the Messiah 700 years before he came. He warned them through all the prophets, and Hosea kept giving them messages after messages of God's love. He even had to take a wife that was a harlot to show the people and remind the people that God loved him. And in his forgiveness, he went and bought his wife off the slave rack. She was already his. She was an adulterous woman. She ran from him and was all caught up in the adultery all the time. Wanted to keep going back. If you have a good husband that loves you, why do you want to keep going back? Because you've been conditioned for a long time just to do that. But when the love of God reveals itself, God reveals himself to you and buys you off that slave rack, there's nothing like that. You can't go back after that. And that's what God was trying to show Israel Once you really have a revelation of who my son is, you are not going to turn back. Your worship's going to go from idols to God worship, set apart, holy, on fire for me. And that's what he wants for the church today. He wants us to be on fire. And scripture that I got this morning, I didn't get to study this, but I don't need to because God's going to reveal it to you. I do kind of know it a little bit, but it says... Revelations 3, 15, and 16, and this is about Jesus speaking this in to the church of Laodicea. And it says, I know your works. You are neither cold or hot. You're lukewarm. You know, we all know what hot is. 
I'm not really sure all about the cold thing yet because I have to study that more because I don't really understand it all. But cold and hot stand out. But lukewarm was like everybody else. Lukewarm was doing what the world was doing. Laodicea was a church that wasn't sitting on the fence, but they were doing what the world was doing. There was no way to tell that they were Christian. They were struggling with the things of the world. Whatever that is, I don't have to explain it. We all have those worldly traits, and we know what they are. But the Lord says, you don't have to have them anymore because I gave my son for you to have victory in those places. So if everybody could just stand. Father God, you are faithful to us. And you love us so much that you sent your son to die on the cross for us. You said in John 3, 16, that the God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And we've all made a choice in here to believe. And if there's anybody that hasn't truly made a choice to believe, you can make that choice tonight. But for those of us who believe, Lord, we ask you to search our hearts and show us those places that we've been unwilling, those idols in our, in our hearts, God, those things that we use as a scapegoat, those things that we use as comfort, whether they're alcohol, fornication, lust, whether it's outbursts of anger, whether it's you know operating in our own strength, control, manipulation, gossip, Whatever it is, Lord, those things that we find bigger than you and somehow give us comfort, those things have to be laid down at the foot of the cross. Those things are no more. They don't have a place in a believer's life because you, God, should have all the place. So we lift those things up to you as a full church tonight, all those things in us. And you give the anointing to break the yoke in those areas. So whatever it is, each person in here has the ability with your help to go to the word of God and find truth that will expel the darkness. You said that if we follow you, we will not walk in darkness, but we will have light, the light of life. Jesus, light is revelation. And you said that you would give us truth for every lie. And you know us better than anybody else. And you said that you've given us the Holy Spirit that will search our hearts, that will the word of God will go in and it will search our hearts and our attitudes and it will divide the soul and the spirit. And we're asking you tonight to give us truth for those lies. We repent as a church. We turn from those things. They have no place in us, no power over us, and no authority anymore. And we disagree with the enemy that they have a place. And we renounce the ungodly things of the world that we've been binding ourselves to. And we receive you, Jesus, as Lord of that place. And we thank you that you are the King of Kings. And we ask you to set our hearts on fire. We ask you to become the fire that consumes our being. We ask you to change us from the inside out so there is no going back. And as we have our time at the altar, Lord, I pray that you would do whatever it is that you want to do. And don't be shy. We want all of you and we are going to give all of ourselves to you in Jesus' name.